Uh, with such an effusive introduction, Michael Harrington used to say this, so I do footnote in my books. He used to say, when I hear an introduction like that, I think of my epitaph and look for my coffin. So. <laughs> but anyway. A um, couple of things. One, just to say that we are a multicultural, multiracial organization, at least my experience in the labor movement. We didn't include that I am a leader of the AFT local at Temple, which includes adjuncts and well, it doesn't include adjuncts yet, we're organized, but like non-tenure track as well as tenured full-time faculty. At least my experience in the labor movement is uh, working class people of all races and genders and sexual orientations generally clap and don't twinkle. But in any event, it's just, we should be multicultural and sometimes we should realize, and also if you, this isn't universally true, but to lead on to Lee Levin's uh, article on the website, which you should read, which is sort of a critical defense of organized and even professional sports, there's a huge question um, about will we keep score under socialism. And again, at least now my experience in coaching a lot of youth sports across race and class is the more working class and more multiracial the community, the more they want to keep score, the more upper middle class, kind of highly educated people, they don't want to keep score. And since I played college baseball, I keep score. But anyway, uh, that said, just as an aside on sort of multicultural and multi-class sensitivities. Um, all right, so what's my task? Not to talk about sports. Um, first of all, I want, to talk, I want to follow up on some of the stuff Steve Williams talked about last night, Catherine Tantaqueen, um, and Michael Leidy in many ways, Gus Newport. They laid the groundwork, so I will try to do this all in sort of 25 minutes. One is talk about vision. In other words, why are we socialists? What are our values? But why are they particularly relevant in an era of neoliberal, and I'll define it later, neoliberal capitalist dominance? What is our mission? I think our mission is to bring a socialist presence, a socialist leaven, into mass movements for democratic equality around a variety of identities, but to build a solidarity across difference, to fight for equal citizenship and citizenship for all, immediate citizenship, for all who labor in our society and care give in our society. In other words, the demand should not be that undocumented workers and their families have citizenship 30, 13 years from now, it should be they should have citizenship today. Right? Immediate. If you, if you do, if we change, if we have problems with global migration patterns, then we have to change United States economic and foreign policy, which destroys indigenous agriculture, local economies, and drives people out of the developing world to the United States. And if we want to stop the pull for cheap wage labor, we have to organize and build a multiracial, multinational labor movement of all people, regardless of citizenship status, so that the demand for exploited low wage labor is curtailed. And I'll talk about that later. So equality of citizenship. And then, of course, we have to fight to not contract public goods and universal social provision like health care and old age pensions, but expand it. And we have to fight against the argument there is no alternative not only to deregulation, to market-driven to market capitalism, to the values of competition over cooperation, but also there is no alternative because we can't afford it. We're broke. We have to fix the debt. There are many, not everybody in this room has to think about organizing other people because if you don't think the right is on a campaign to divide the young from the old and the old from the young, you haven't been watching the news. And this isn't just the right. This is the center right and many of the leadership of the Democratic Party, including President Obama, whose budget speech in April 2013 includes $400 billion in cuts in Social Security and Medicare over the next 10 years by moving to the chain CPI, in other words, a cost of living adjustment which will be less generous to working retired people, and by basically cutting Medicare costs, squeezing the medical profession, which unfortunately the, cost, the squeeze won't come on the providers and on the medical instrument people and the biotech companies. It will come on provision for the elderly. And you just have to read Tom Friedman in the New York Times. We may have been in England together on the same fellowship, but I vomit every time I read Tom's columns. Um, Tom and Pete Peterson, the former head of Lehman Brothers, which then failed, and the Blackstone Group, which does horrible hedge fund shit. Um, basically, they say that old people are getting rich on these entitlements and they're starving young people. So young people should be for cutting Social Security, you're not going to get it. And what they don't say is 
their policy of entrepreneurship for everyone, everyone's a radical individual, no one should have public support for education, public support for higher ed, no one should have public support for decent retirement income, no one should have public support for universal health care. Their gutting of the public sector is dependent on, and this is what I want to sort of talk about as well, austerity didn't fall from the sky. It came from a class project called neoliberalism that we need an analysis of, which does four things that I said before. One, you defund the public sector by massive tax giveaways to the rich, the upper class, and corporations. So there's no money, right? Grover Norquist said this. We will drown the little remaining baby of the state in the little amount of remaining tax revenue, bathwater. Right, we'll so squeeze down the state, people won't really recognize it or see it or mean anything to them, except maybe in their old age. And then we'll drown it in no tax revenue. So defund the state, gut public provision, which is exactly what's happening in public education, particularly in inner cities around this country. Right, the education reform movement is a total Democratic Party neoliberal project. I'll talk about it a bit later. So gut public provision, right? Deunionize, right? Unions are old, they're antiquated, they defend the lowest common denominator, they drive up costs. You know, well, labor costs are way down in the auto industry. And last I saw, you know, it's not making us highly more competitive compared to higher wage, better made German cars. Um, so deunionize, and then of course deregulate. That environmental regulation is holding back entrepreneurship. Health and safety regulations are holding back entrepreneurship. What they're essentially saying is, we should go back to sweatshops. And we are in this country. There is no right to unionize in most of this country. And there is no right to health and safety and a voice on the job. Occupational safety and health industries in this country, compared to most of the OECD, most of Northern Europe, are horrendous, right? And um, basically, we're back to sweatshops, but what they forget is sweatshop late wages lead to sweatshop worker living conditions. Right? One of the big things we have to say is that ever since the 1980s, you know, as Warren Buffett, the only honest member of the ruling class, says, my class declared war on yours. And some of you have heard this quote from me, but John Reed, who, not our John Reed, but the John Reed of um, Citibank in the City Corp in the late 1980s, speaking at a business roundtable meeting, said, American workers have to realize they're now competing in industrial production, aircraft, small aircraft, with Brazilian workers. And they have to realize they have to get their wages down to Brazilian levels. What the MF didn't tell you, excuse my French, uh, which got me on Fox News, by the way. <laughs> no, but um, what the MF didn't say, or the whatever, father fucker, or whatever, to be more appropriate, but anyway, didn't say, oh, whatever, that's horrible, but anyway, uh, I was just trying to be gender neutral, sorry. Um, what, what he didn't say was that if you get Brazilian wages down to Brazilian levels, you have Brazilian living standards. And for much of this country, we have to remember, the median family income in this country is 50,000. That's the same as it was in 1979, right? The only reason why family living standards haven't fallen further is, the American working family works 30% more than it did in 1979 because of the massive entrance, entry of women into the workforce. We also have to realize that there are less people percentage-wise. Labor force participation now is as low as it was in 1972. 58% of adults between 18 and 65 who are employable work. 63% are looking for work. About another 5% are so discouraged they're not looking for work. And that's the lowest level of employment since the early 1970s. Now, in part, that's because productivity is up, particularly in manufacturing. But what's crazy about neoliberalism, which is a class project, to, and this is something we have to really deal with in our strategy, it's a class project to redistribute power and wealth upwards. And therefore, our project has to be to redistribute not just income and wealth and control over capital, but power downwards to the vast majority, right? This project of, of redistributing upwards means that, you know, we can't really, that with these massive increases in productivity, we say not that people should work a shorter working life, they can work less, a shorter work week, we should have paid parental and maternity leave, parental and maternal leave, we should have universal paid childcare. They say we can't afford it, and guess what? You have to work until you drop dead. I mean, this is, we need 
not to defend Social Security. We have to radically expand Social Security. And one of the things that we're going to see is, yes, somewhat it is true that 25, 20 um, people above 65 who are mostly, particularly if they're 70 or older, were born, quote, in the silent generation before the baby boom. So they came of political age during the Eisenhower years. They're fairly conservative. But the people who came of age, even whites, in the baby boom are more liberal, but also they're in for a big shock. They're not that radical, to say the least, particularly whites. But they're in for a big shock because none of them realize that their retirements are going to be much more precarious than those of their parents who retired in the 60s and 70s and 80s, right? Why? Because half of Americans at work have no pensions, period. They're just going to live on Social Security, which if any of you have relatives who live just on Social Security, you are not partying, right? Basically, Social Security will provide the income of somebody who made about $28,000 a year in the labor market, maybe, the average Social Security provision with the tax differences, right? 50% of people who do have pensions, two-thirds of those now are on defined contribution plans. You don't get a defined guaranteed benefit when you retire that the corporation is supposed to save for, invest, and pay you. You're supposed to save yourself. This is neoliberalism. I'm an individual. I will pay for college by going into debt. I will put a little money away every year and save. And, you know, the average, economists always tell you you need 15 to 20 times your income to retire and keep your income the same. You need 15 to 20 times in wealth your income. Just do the 5% discounting, etc. Nobody has that. In fact, half of Ameri the half of American workers that have pensions, two-thirds of those who have defined contribution, when they retire, the average they have in those accounts is $50,000. You know what annuity that buys you? About $1,500 a year. That is, in my neighborhood, we call that chunk change. Right? So people, are, the baby boomers are going to come in for a big shock and hint there was another time baby boomers became militant, right? They were children of the 30s who thought the racism and sexism of the 60s and 70s and the militarism of the 60s and 70s were horrendous, and they were called the Great Panthers. You know, and um, Maggie Coon just passed away a few years ago. This room could reignite the Great Panthers. We are, many of us, I mean, there are very few people between 55, I'm 59, between 59 and 35 here. The older crowd, you know, in terms of organizing people around you, Medicare, Social Security, people are not going to be happy in retirement. And there are a lot of us retiring who come out of the new left, and we got to build a new, new left. So it's not just a question of organizing people out there. The other thing about neoliberal capitalism, it really is, you can argue about the 1% or the 20%, but it really does create a mass working class and excluded population, probably 80% of whom really struggle in their daily lives to make enemies meet. There is, and this is the only people who Tom Friedman will ever mention, there is a symbolic manipulator class, that's Robert Reich's term when he wasn't as radical as he is now. Uh, we should all become symbolic manipulators, go to university, tech up, go into the STEM fields, biotech, um, hospital, university administration, uh, finance, of course, you know, Ivy Leaguers used to all go into finance, now they can't all go into it, but the finance industry is trying to make sure they, in the future, will be able to by expanding inexorably. That 20% does okay to really, really, really well, the top 1%. But <laughs> here's the deal. In 19, here's what happened with deregulation, deindustrialization, deunionization, and defunding the public sector. There was massive redistribution of wealth and income upwards, and on a very raced and gendered pattern. In 1973, from 1947 to 73, and then I'll get into what this means for our strategy. In 47 to 73, real incomes doubled as did the GDP. From 79 to 2007, and many of you have heard this from Bill and Peg, get up, GDP doubles again. Median family income goes up 17%, not doubles, 17%. The top 1%, because, and only because of the massive entry of women into the workforce, high school educated, non-college educated men's real wages drop 12% because there are no good industrial unionized jobs left in America. What happened to the 1%? In 1973, the top 1% earned 8.5% of the income. Today they earn 23% of the income. In 1973, the top 1% owned about 22% of the wealth. 
Today, the top 1% owns 40% of the wealth. Now, what this means for our strategy. Um, some of you are old enough to remember that the strategy that DSA first had, someone coming out of the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, assumed there was a mass liberal left grounded in a fairly strong, though somewhat under siege, labor movement. NAM had a sort of strategy, the New American Movement, which came out of sort of the New Left and SDS, had a similar analysis, but emphasized more, one, socialist feminism, but two, local organizing around people's basic needs, in some ways anticipating the crisis, because 70 to 73 was a pretty bad period around housing, energy, utility rates, urban political power. Um, but we all sort of assumed that there was somewhat of, a, of the remnants of a New Deal pro-labor coalition. The material conditions for the New Deal labor civil rights coalition collapsed in the 70s and 80s with deindustrialization. And we have to remember that part of the crisis of, I mean, one of the great gains of the last 50 years is the creation of a large black and somewhat Latino middle and upper middle class. But one of the great tragedies is that deindustrialization meant that people, particularly in urban areas, particularly people of color, but also deindustrialized white men in particular, saw a radical decrease in their life opportunities and living standards. And what we did with mostly older white men in particular was we somewhat enabled them to get onto disability, we somewhat sort of prioritized sort of giving them lower wage service sector jobs. What we did with younger people of color, particularly men, but not just men, was totally criminalize them and incarcerate them. That's how we handled deindustrialization. And just as blacks and Latinos were getting manufacturing unionized jobs, those jobs in the late 60s after tremendous struggles both within the labor movement and the civil rights movement, those jobs began to be shipped overseas. Now one thing, one thing that's key for our strategy and that we have to take into account, what we didn't know then was that this deindustrialization would in some ways fragment the working class, decrease its sort of industrial composition, but also lead to both the United States and Europe, and this is something we really have to struggle with and was talked about last night, to somewhat of a, particularly among older white men, but older whites from, with non-college education, to somewhat of, it's sometimes exaggerated, a white nativist populist background, backlash. Um, here's where we come in and here's where racial reaction comes in. Um, we were not totally unaware of this, the left. In the 1970s, many people, late 70s, early 80s, many people got excited by DSOC NAM, the DSA merger, because it was part of a broader sort of coming together of various strands of the European left, somewhat the Latin American left, particularly in, of course, they're tremendously repressed in Chile and tremendously subverted by the IMF in the US in Jamaica, but there was a view that if social democracy was going to continue, and by social democracy I would define as strong unions, strong progressive taxation, yielding high quality universal public goods, child care, health care, old age security, that that what we call social contract, social market economy, was in jeopardy because profits were being squeezed. What we have to remember is we put Socialists put on the agenda democratic control over capital, which we have to do again, and I will argue particularly around public investment, and I'll come to that in a minute, when the labor movement was strong and when social movements around nationalities, racial emancipation, civil rights, feminism, environmentalism, were militant and in the streets. I mean, that's what forced Richard Nixon to be the last pro-welfare state president, mostly for whites. It's very manipulative around affirmative action. But Nixon almost doubles the real value of Social Security, indexes to, to inflation, and creates the EPA. He didn't do that because he was a left winger. The guy was an imperialist. I can't use the term that I already was homophobic and gender basically about, but he was an asshole. Um, but he was forced to do the right thing. And hint, we didn't get Obama. We knew Obama was going to, forget what Obama is, who knows? But we knew he would govern to not upset finance unless there was mass unrest in the streets. And hint, the Obama administration didn't disappoint me because I knew the left was too weak to force him to do the right thing. Right? And Obama even said, I can only do good things if you force me to do them 
by being in the streets. Well, we were in the streets in the 70s. Some of you forget this, but in the late 60s, early 70s, Henry Kissinger worried about a socialist revolution in Italy. That's where he was going to send the Sixth Fleet next, right? Um, not only to overthrow Allende, but to overthrow this dude called Enrico Berlinguer, the head of the Communist Party, which got 34% of the vote, but the right got 36 and the Italian project sort of declined from then. Mitterrand wins in 1981 in France on a, on a campaign that says, we will make a fundamental break with capitalism. And don't forget, overnight he nationalizes 30% of French production. Comes into power now, he paid 100%. He should have only paid 51%. That gives you controlling interest. He overpaid the capitalist class. And he introduces much stronger labor rights. To this day, I mean, France is, this is, Europe has had deindustrialization, but because Northern Europe, labor rights are stronger in the Constitution, even where union density is lower. Germany's now 25%, used to be 45 But 70% of workers are covered by union contracts because works councils mean that any firm 50 people or above has to bargain. In France, this is the weirdest thing, France is an open shop. There are multiple unions in every shop. Only 10% of French workers pay dues because you can free ride. And it's a political thing to pay dues. But the Oru laws passed in the late 60s requires that there be collective bargaining between worker reps and management in any firm of 50 or more people. And if the bargaining comes to an impasse, there's binding state arbitration. <laughs> So 70 per 60 percent of French workers are covered by union contracts, even though 10 percent pay dues. In the United States, 13 percent of people are in, are in unions, and maybe 15 percent are covered by union contracts in some non-right to work states boosted. So we're totally de-unionized. And what happened was, basically, and this affects our strategy, we thought that by building a socialist wing within a broad labor liberal left, we could put on the table speak into the mic. Uh, sorry, we could put on the table democratic control over capital. By, and in the late 70s, early 80s, in France, in Italy, in Sweden, where the Meitner plan advanced by the Swedish Union said, we will tax corporate profits for 25 years at about a 5% rate. And by that time, we will have investable pools of capital run by elected boards of workers and consumers that could buy up the majority of Swedish industry. Sweden may have high progressive taxation, strong unions. Basically, eight family conglomerates run Sweden. It's a capitalist society, constrained by a sort of strong social democratic left. So, basically, the right says, understanding our analysis, that strong labor movement, strong social movement, strong environmental movement, strong movement for rights of workers of color, etc., constrains capital. And they went on a class warfare, and they won. The alternative to the left socialist project of socializing industry, of creating workers' control at the site of production, was to deregulate and to basically weaken labor and basically set off a competitive downward spiral. So what happens is, but how do you create a majority? How do you create a majority that's basically going to endorse, and this is our challenge, we have to understand the racial and racist project of the right, not just in the United States but also in Europe. How can you convince a lot of former members of the Communist Party in Northern Europe and France and Italy to vote for right-wing nativist anti-immigrant parties? You channel their anger at losing jobs to deindustrialization, not to the corporations that have outsourced production around the globe to the lowest wage workers and not allow them to unionize. We're not against moving industrial production to China or the developing world. We're for, or South Africa, we're for workers raising their living standards, raising their democratic rights through fighting for free trade unions. But what happened here was you blame people beneath you, right? It's white skin privilege, right? It's that the real problem was, and this was, poli this was the politics of Thatcher in England, and to some extent in a milder way, third way social democrats and the right in Europe, the real problem is the moochers, right? People of color, immigrants who are scamming the system and taking all your hard-earned dollars, hint. AFDC was only half a percent of the federal budget and about 5% of state budgets. Medicaid is much more, you know, a bigger part of the little help we give poor and working people in this country. But it became the issue, hit particularly in the United States and Britain, because we're the only two advanced capitalist countries where there isn't universal childcare. If there was universal childcare, there wouldn't be hostility 
to some low-income mothers, temporarily single mothers, temporarily exiting the workforce for very short periods, and then usually going right back into the workforce that they, they had been in before their infants were born, exiting the workforce because they needed to parent. And work didn't pay enough. That was the issue in the work welfare debate. It wasn't that welfare paid too much, it was that work paid too little. So what do we have to say, and what are our tasks? First, we have to engage in much more explicit ideological critique. That is critique of a dominant way of viewing the world that says it is natural to have unrestrained corporate competition. It is natural that you should make it on your own. It is natural to have everybody subject to the myth of Horatio Alger. Right? This is the first generation that will be downly mobile in America, yet what's their message? Invest more in yourself, go more into debt, get more degrees, when hint, there aren't even enough high-wage good jobs for all the crap college graduates there are today. Right? So one, we want to say, this is the wealthiest country in the world. We have to redistribute wealth and power. We can afford to have good schools for everyone. Hint, we've got to put back on the agenda, which the Ed Reform Movement will never say. You can't have good schools for all unless they're class and racially integrated. Right? That the way we fund education, federalism, is crazy. But that you're not serious. If you're going to keep segregated schools by race and class, the most money, the best teachers, the schools as round-the-clock communities have to be for all children, particularly lower-income children, but not just for Jeffrey Canada's Harlem Empowerment Zone, where a bunch of foundations pour in some money. And foundations can't do this on a national scale. Bill Gates' foundation is only worth $80 billion. He's a wealthy guy. The federal budget is $3.7 trillion a year. That's the money we need to deal with higher education and K-12 education. We can afford this, but we have to do a few things that are quite radical, and this is why I think, you know, to sort of begin to sort of move to conclusion. The reform revolution debate doesn't really make that much sense to me. I think there's strengths in both Chris's paper and Tim's paper, because if you don't have the social movement and class power to force redistribution of income and wealth, expanding public goods, increasing the rights of low-wage workers, allowing for unionization of low-wage work, you're not going to be able to win the class and social movement power and electoral and state power to socialize control over production, to democratize the workplace, and to basically, in Marxist language, expropriate the expropriators. It's not an accident that the argument for democratic control over the workplace was highest when union density was highest, the left was strongest, and reforms were being won. Because defeats don't radicalize people, they demoralize people. Defeats don't radicalize people, they demoralize people. So how do we get on a positive sort of movement to reform that yields radical transformation? How do we relate, as the questions will be asked, sort of defensive battles to defend the welfare state and expand it to battles for greater working people's power? One is we have an opening in that we need public investment. We can't deal with the climate crisis without massive public investment in alternative energy and an alternative energy grid. The private sector isn't doing it, they won't do it, it's too risky, it's too capital intensive, particularly a new grid. Um, second of all, they have no real interest in mass transit. They destroyed mass transit, they will do it again. Mass transit has to be publicly built. We should be building mass transit vehicles, not in Canada or Japan or other places where we build it, but in the United States. Thirdly, we need to repair infrastructure. This country is falling freaking apart. And it's mostly falling freaking apart where working class and people of color live. I mean, we're going to have a sewage crisis. All these private individuals have to pay for their 1900 sewage going broke and uh, breaking in urban cities. There's need for retrofitting of housing. We don't have decent housing for people in, in urban areas. So we have to put on public investment. But we also have to come back to the socialist value, not just of democratic control of production, which, um, but also democratic control over consumption and funding of human needs. One other issue about public control of investment, how you move from reform to radicalism, and then I'll talk about the social wage and strategy, and then I'll conclude. Um, pension funds. The right is telling us you have no right to a public pension or a private pension. Public pensions may be underfunded by about $2 trillion. You can argue if the market recovers less. But that's only about 0.3 of 1% of state gross, gross state product. And Bill Barkley's absolutely right. In Illinois, he and his 
fellow sort of coalition members, are pushing to use a financial transaction tax to shore up the pension fund, public pension fund that's probably in the worst sort of situation. But this is going to be an attack on public pensions in Detroit, all over the country. And we have to say there's enough collective wealth if we tax people properly and invest through democratic state institutions and not paying hedge funds to ruin public pensions, we can, um, we can solve the pension crisis. The private pension crisis is that basically private corporations aren't investing enough, they go out of business, we need a stronger national insurance system, so that's pension. Whether it be education, whether it be health care, we need universal high quality goods. And um, two things to conclude in terms of strategy. One is we have to build a new rainbow coalition. Means we have to think about how do you build solidarity while affirming different identities, right, without homogenizing identities. Because if you think about where the real agency for this is going to come, and this is why we have to get much more activists on the grassroots, much more involved in low-wage justice, anti-incarceration, defense of public education, um, immigrant rights, rebuilding the labor movement, is that uh, sort of a multinational, multicultural rainbow of the excluded will fight back. And that isn't just about them out there. Students of all races, and yes, it is true that only 35% may get four-year degrees, 65% of high school students start community college or above. They go into debt, they often don't finish. It's not just about them out there. The seniors here, the students here, or the recent college graduates, democratic socialism is in your immediate interest. It's not just about solidarity with more oppressed groups, it's about solidarity among ourselves. But the only way to do that, finally, is nobody's going to listen to you if you're not in motion with them. The reason why the strike debt, the student debt project, is so important is it gives us an opportunity to talk to people who aren't socialists about a universal public good and about solving in the short run the debt crisis, but free higher ed. I don't care what locals do, but you've got to be out there petitioning, going to demos, and tabling, and talking to people about universal public goods and democratic control over capital. And finally, we have to engage in public education. We have to engage in more ideological critique. We have to come out of the closet. I mean, you see ISO posters all over the freaking place. DSA has to do forums, and you'll draw a much more diverse audience. And this is my last conclusion. If you work with public sector workers fighting back, inner city families fighting for democratic education, immigrants fighting for immediate citizenship. If you gain their trust and you do a forum on global capitalism and the, migra the crisis of migrant rights, people will come. People much more diverse than we in this audience. But nobody is going to be interested in you if you're not standing shoulder to shoulder with them. There are a lot of diverse movements of the foreclosed. I won't go through the list. But locals have to be involved in at least one. And then think about how you tie an educational critique of neoliberal capitalism to defense of a transitional program to democratic socialism. And we can't get to democratic socialism until we tax the rich in corporations, redistribute through universal public goods, because no matter how much low-wage workers win through unionization, they're still going to need public health care, public housing, public income security, right? And then, of course, we can't win that unless we gain increasing control over pension funds, over public investment, and eventually democratic control over the economy itself. Thank you. Thank you. So, can I have a show of hands? How many people feel like their heads are about to explode? Thank you, Joe. <laughs> I'm built up to tolerance. Uh, I've heard Joe described as a verbal machine gun. Um, so, uh, in terms of a time check, I have... Um,